Welcome everyone to the Institute of World Culture in Santa Barbara. The Institute is a nonprofit educational organization founded on July 4th, 1976 by Raghavan and Nandini Iyer uh, with 10 aims, which can be found on um, the worldculture.org website. Uh, foremost among those aims is the promotion of universal brotherhood and the fostering of human fellowship among all races, nations, and cultures, and to encourage lifelong learning um, in men and women of all ages who seek to understand and make a contribution to world culture and to universal welfare. Additional information about the activities of the Institute can be found uh, in the monthly newsletter besides the, our website. Uh, copies are at the back table, and you can also sign up to receive the newsletter uh, through emailing jerry at worldculture.org. This event is being uh, given live at Concord Hall, Hall in Santa Barbara at the Institute, but it's also being streamed uh, via uh, our YouTube website, which is uh, I, uh, IWC in Santa Barbara, one word, uh, on, on YouTube. And that is actually thanks to our speaker tonight, uh, Russ Lewin. My name's Kirk Gradine, and I'll be serving as the chair for today's event. In uh, pursuit of this year's theme, the Institute has a theme for each year, uh, and this year it is interdependence, diversity, and imagination. Um, under, the, uh, under that heading, we have uh, today's talk, which is Design as Discovery, Joni Ive and Frank Gehry. Um, and this uh, talk really um, also uh, harkens to several aims of the Institute, uh, most pertinently, perhaps, number three and four. Number three is to honor through appropriate observance the contributions of men and women of all ages to world culture. And number four is to enhance the enjoyment of the creative artistry and craftsmanship of all cultures. And today we'll, we'll be uh, seeing two uh, outstanding examples of creative individuals who are making uh, this, very, this very type of contribution. Our speaker, uh, who most of you who are here know, uh, is Russ Lewin, and he has been a grateful member of the Institute, as he says, since 1976, since its founding. He was a past president of, president of the Institute, and he was also a teacher for, um, what, 30 years or so, taught math, physics, robotics, and film production at Santa Barbara Middle School. And as I mentioned, he is responsible for the entire electronic setup that we have here, um, audio and visual streaming services, et cetera, et cetera. Single-handedly, almost, uh, set it up and keeps it running and functioning, uh, which is, you know, would be normally the work of 10 or 15 people. So yeah, we're grateful to Russ. At least, maybe more. Maybe more, <laughs> yeah, 20, 20. So next time, 20, we'll say. <laughs> Uh, Russ has given uh, many presentations at the Institute, and I'm just going to mention a few of them. Uh, the first one kind of gives you an idea of sort of the scope of his, <laughs> of what he endeavors to do, is called A Grand Tour of the Solar System, the Outer Planets and Trans-Neptunian Objects. Uh, he gave a remarkable talk on Hellenistic civilization, in particular science and mathematics, when lightning strikes. And what, what kind of lightning is he talking about? The geometrical luminaries of Hellenistic culture, which uh, for those, those who have studied geometry, it was, it was very exciting and very electric. Um, he's given many talks on the, the Hubble telescope uh, throughout its journey, um, almost on a yearly basis, it seems like. Um, one titled Space Within Space, The Cosmos Rediscovered. 
uh, another called Renaissance Discoveries in Astronomy, and one that he and I actually did together was called Dali and Gaudi, Mythic Space, in which he produced a film for that event. So, yeah, surprised all of us. Uh, <laughs> and then there was a series of three. Um, I, the recent, I think this was last year, Eyes on the Cosmos, the James Webb Space Telescope, Eyes on the Earth, Earth Orbiting Satellites, and Eyes on Mars. Um, he's also uh, given us talks on uh, the, uh, some of the luminaries of American, the American experiment. One talk on Ben Franklin and the Republic of Science, and another on Starlight in the Stone Temple of the West, John Wesley Powell. So with that, we'll give the, the chair to our speaker. Thank you, Kirk. <clears throat> Can everybody hear okay and see okay? A okay, a little, little bit louder, yeah. like that? Yeah. Okay, thanks for coming today, bye. Um, <laughs> so um, today we want to talk about it as design as discovery, and it's fortuitous that Kirk introduced it because years ago, Kirk is an architect. Like, he builds real things. I build sort of castles in the sky. Uh, we were talking about architecture, and he said, well, what are some of your favorite buildings and structures? And I said, well, I really like Costco, Home Depot buildings. <laughs> They're very practical. Yeah, there's doors, really big doors, that kind of thing. And he said, well, you know, you should consider Frank Gehry um, because he's doing things. You're into computers and all that. He's doing things where he's taking... Uh, his ideas and using uh, software from airplanes. I think a French company had uh, airplane software and adapting it to um, buildings so that he can take these really crazy, you know, kind of flowing designs and actually turn them into structures. So thank you, Kirk, for that. I appreciate it. Um, so let's go to the slides. And... Um, And we'll get this going. There we go. Yeah. So um, the, today's topic is that design leads to discovery. And we should really explain what we mean by that. Uh, the premise, and one of the great premises of the Institute, is that every human being, regardless of race or gender or age, is really a creative fount of energy that can be applied to not only self-improvement, but the improvement of the whole human race. And that um, if we become aware of that and then articulate our skills in various directions, we'll gain tremendous strengths, but in doing so, we'll discover aspects of ourselves and others and the whole of humanity. There'll be a sort of a general uplifting, but this doesn't happen casually. So in other words, if we just sort of are happy-go-lucky individuals, uh, like most of us are, but don't apply ourselves, we may not make those discoveries. So today, what we want to do is build on that idea and try to sort of discover how to design and what kind of discoveries we can expect. Now, this is really premised on the idea of human nature. So a lot of times we may identify with some kind of lower categories, but um, there's sort of dimensions to human nature. Not only are we physical individuals, but, but we have mind and we have spirit, and that those can all sort of work together to create um, kind of like unusual and more directed experiences that are positive and engaging and lead to greater contentment and greater happiness. But we have to sort of go through a process in order to make this occur. So this obviously is a butterfly coming out of the cocoon and a monarch butterfly. So in nature, form always has a function, but sometimes we sort of overlooked that and we say, oh, what a beautiful waterfall or what a beautiful river or what a beautiful butterfly. But all of these things have an actual function and their design matches the function. The form matches the function. 
but the design element is the thing that elevates it. Now, these are pictures of a um, um, bunch of butterflies, monarchs taken out at the Elwood Grove. And uh, it's interesting, I mean, when we see it, we always wonder, or we should, we should raise questions, you know, like, what are they doing? Why are they, like, posing in that position? Why are they so brilliantly orange? Where do they come from? You know, the first step is to sort of, like, raise those kinds of questions. And the actual color um, has, has a, it's sort of like, it's off-putting to a lot of the predators and they can actually put out a kind of scent as well. So, um, you know, the design has a, an actual purpose, as is the case of an orchid. And these are like remarkably beautiful things. And there are people like at Nike and places like that who make shoes and study these things all day and try to adapt them to their shoes in various ways or clothes designers, try to mimic nature. And... Um, you know, the orchids actually attract pollinating wasps, so they sort of like nestle in there. But every year, we go out to the orchid fair at uh, Earl Warren, where this was taken, and it's completely magical, uh, not only to, to the eyes, but, but to, to the sense of smell as well. And then there are just this grand dynamic designs of nature, which are almost incomprehensible, these intricate and beautiful, powerful systems of um, you know, clouds and the ocean and the water cycle and how the light plays off of all of these things. It's like it serves its function as well. And then there are playful elements too, like giraffes. And you might say, oh, you know, giraffes are really great for making uh, stuffed animals, something like that. <laughs> But they are actually live in the wild of Africa, and um, you know they've adapted so that they can actually reach to um, a higher altitude and forage off the tops of trees rather than than the low lying leaves. But in order to do that, they have to have a very powerful heart, uh, weighs like 23 pounds, and then it has to generate like a lot of pressure in order to maintain a constant flow of blood to the brain. And there's a very intricate, intricate system of how their arteries work. So that's another form function relationship. But then there's an interdependence between systems. And so, you know, we have birds and different animals who not only sustain themselves through nectar, but pollinate and there's an interaction between the plant world and, and the animal world as well. And so sort of the point of all this is nature has a way of balancing these systems in a way that's so beautifully designed, we barely ever notice the mechanism. We're enthralled and it's natural and it's organic. Now, when it comes to human beings and the sorts of things we build, um, sometimes it does not have quite the allure of an orchid or of um, some of the animals that we see. It's almost haphazard and it seems almost as if there was very little plan at all. And um, now I bring this up because this is the LA River, which actually is an actual river 50 miles long. And Frank Gehry is working on designing a project to revitalize the LA River, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. We also marvel at our ability to build large structures that almost defy gravity and entice us in terms of engineering and systems and the ability to you know, move everybody around and elevate everybody. But there's always something lacking about a city. I mean, it serves its function, is the design really there? I mean, is taller really a design? So, you know, it, it begs the question, how can we think differently about these things? How can we actually say, I can design something better? Not only in the products that we make, but in our own nature. So there's a dual function today, like how do we design things and how do we design ourselves. And those are sort of mutually interdependent. So where do you start? Well, I'd like to go all the way back to Chief Seattle. 
because um, the American Indians who lived in nature and had this deep sense of it really had wisdom that they could share with us. And he says, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. And in a sense, this seems natural to us, but it's much more profound than we usually give it credit for. Because when we talk about connection and we talk about Johnny Ive, the products he makes reach over 2 billion people. The entire globe is interconnected by the sorts of things that we're designing now. And that's a really important thing to consider in terms of like, how can we make it more human? How can we make it better? How can we make it elevating? And then a phrase from an, from an ancient Buddhist text around which the whole presentation is built, a book called The Voice of the Silence, where it says, help nature and work on with her and nature will regard thee as one of her creators and make obeisance. So when we think about design and creating, it's not an independent function. We are part of the great web. And we, when we sort of surrender our personal nature and start to think in larger interconnected terms, it releases a fount of energy that can be used in much more universal ways. And the speakers that are the, the people that will be studying today are really exemplars of this. Now, who are these speakers? Well, today we have the privilege of studying uh, uh, Frank Gehry, uh, the great architect, and Johnny Ive, he's Canadian, Canadian architect, and then uh, Johnny Ive, who is a British individual and who had worked for Apple for probably close to 30 years and now is an independent designer. Um, so these two individuals are sort of um, luminaries in the world of design because they're so bold, so different, and they set completely new trends, one in sort of computer design and communication and the other in terms of architecture. So we'd like to get in and explore both of them. Uh, let's start with Frank. And this is Frank Gehry, and he's working with Mark Zuckerberg in this slide, who is the CEO of Meta, which is also Facebook. And they're sort of designing a project together. And Mark wants to have a large you know, building built for tens of thousands of people, but he wants them all communicating and a little office building with little rooms is not gonna work for him. So the first step is he, we have to have, you know, what's the function that you're after before we put a form to it? And he says, it's pretty simple and it isn't fancy, but that's on purpose. We want our space to feel like a work in progress. When you enter our buildings, we want you to feel how much there is left to be done in our mission to connect the world, which is sort of an interesting assignment that, that Frank would have. He doesn't want a finished product, he wants a dynamic product. And um, so he, Frank talks with them and, and the way he does, he gets to know the individual, what kind of art do you like, um, you know, uh, what kind of books do you like to read, and, and he really tries to get a feel for, for the person and, and the business that he may be working for. And then he sort of ruminates on this for a period of time. And uh, an average project for Frank would take six to seven years. And after he sort of gets an idea, and we're gonna explore how he does that soon, he comes up with a model. And he's got this really fantastic studio where they have, it's not just Frank and one or two other people, there's like 50, 100 individuals working and they're working on building these models and sort of crafting them. So they came up with something in Menlo Park that looks like this. It's a huge building. It's over, over half a million square feet in the building, and it's got a living roof because, as you'll see in a moment, 
the interior of the building is well utilized with individuals. And if they want to go for a walk, if they walk around the top of the building once or twice, it's over a mile. And there are all kinds of things to sort of connect them with, with nature. But if you move to the interior of the building, so this is, this is uh, a project in which there was unlimited money to spend, pretty much, and probably the greatest architect of the time, bringing their minds together, and this is what they came up with. <laughs> there it is. They wanted something dynamic where people interface with each other and share ideas. That's what they wanted, and that's what they built. And it's massive, and it's huge, so that everywhere you go, there's chairs sort of strewn around and odd art on the wall. They don't want it codified. They don't want it limited. They want everything to be very, very flowy. So there are individuals in this building who literally uh, ride skateboards with a kind of like a harness while they program, literally, <laughs> skateboard, or bicycle, um, or unicycle, and that's perfectly fine. Um, they have art on the wall to sort of try to provoke you to think a little bit differently. And challenging things. Move fast and break things. Um, they sort of fashion themselves after hackers, and so, Frank doesn't think he, it's for him to say he's taking the energy from the client and turning it into something. So the roof structure, at least to me, is, is where I would do my work. And um, you can go up there, and it's very, very quiet. And it's right on the bay so that you can get an inspiration from nature. And Frank says, a well-designed home has to be very comfortable. I can't stand the aesthetic. The minimal thing. I can't stand to live that way. My home has to be filled with stuff. Paintings, sculpture, and my fish lamps. Cardboard furniture, lots of books. I couldn't live in the Farnsworth house. So he's sort of making a statement and then, you know, it's sort of like what actually happened as Frank and Mark worked together and talked together. Mark finally said, make the, the new meta building look like your studio. Your studio is chaotic, but it's dynamic and it's working. Make Facebook that way. And that's, wh and that's what they ended up doing. That's the Farnsworth house. I love the Farnsworth house. <laughs> but Frank doesn't. He's got to have stuff around. But there's another person that likes the Farnsworth house. And that's Johnny Ive. He's interested in perfection, sort of Zen motifs. I, I will show you a camera that he built in a little bit uh, for Leica, and he bought, built 550 iterations of it, 550, until, as he put it, it was perfect. So he is responsible for being the um, the designer for our, all of the stuff that we use, like the iPhone and the Mac and the iMac and the AirPods and, you know, basic iPad, you, you name it, he, he designed it. He didn't necessarily build it. They have thousands of engineers that specialize in coding and software um, development and, um, you know, all, all of those sorts of things. Um, but when it came down to what will the user interface be, Johnny's the guy. And so we're going to talk about, you know, uh, how, how he did it. But now if you compare that to this, the meta building, that's the inside of Apple Park. It's pristine. I don't want to work at the Facebook building. I want to work there. <laughs> but maybe some would like to be in the Facebook building. They're, they're, they compare and contrast in really different, strange ways. And so, but the, he has an organic vision. So he, they built a circle, and the circle's um, exactly one mile in circumference, but they've got like an orchard and a lake 
and trails all through the center of it. So wherever you are, you're sort of facing nature. And a lot of people sort of criticize them, no matter what they do, they get a lot of criticism, and we're gonna talk about how they deal with that, because it's pretty interesting. It's not people just throwing uh, confetti at them. Al almost everything they do is heavily criticized. So when he built all this, he got a fair amount of criticism, and his response was, we didn't make Apple Park for other people. So a lot of the criticisms are utterly bizarre because it wasn't made for you. And I know how we work, and you don't. <laughs> so I, th I liked his response, because he wasn't really bitter, but he just put it you know, in context. Um, so we're going to dive into Johnny in just a minute. But let's start with Frank. So Frank is a Canadian, and uh, you know he, he was born in uh, Toronto and came to uh, L.A. when he was uh, 1947. So um, if you're not familiar with his work, um, some are, some aren't, I'll, I'll just, I'd like to just show you just a couple of slides without saying too much about it, just so that you can get the flavor of what he's doing. So this is a, a building in Bilbao, Spain. It's covered in titanium. This is the Disney Center, Disney Concert Hall, and um, home to the LA Philharmonic. Just out of curiosity, how many have been to the Disney Center? Okay, about half. Great, great. Um, Bard College in New York. The Dancing House in Prague, Czech Republic. It's different. Uh, this is a hotel in Spain. No laughing is allowed. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Uh, this is the um, Louis Vuitton Foundation building, uh, and it's an art museum in uh, France, Paris. Frank does have a sailboat. Now, uh, Frank does, as I mentioned, Frank doesn't just hang out, uh, um, you know, quietly by himself in, a, in an office somewhere. He's got a massive staff, and um, people come and, and, and help, and, and they work really long hours in all kinds of different ways. But Frank himself is a little bit different in how he works. So people... Um, you know, bring him projects. He works on about 20 projects at a time. And the projects take six, seven years, and there's a lot of site work, and it's all over the planet, and there's like back and forth with all the clients. But he's sort of just, he, he doesn't move fast, he doesn't talk fast. He's a contemplative. So he, he says, he bluntly says, you know, um, when I, when I start a project, I try not to have any kind of idea of what it's going to be like. Just clear the deck. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to know what I'm doing. I just want to be open to the project. And then he starts you know, taking ideas, and he does sketches, and, and, and he starts putting things together. Sometimes he'll take random objects like... Um, He'll take a Perrier bottle and like an apple out of someone's lunch and put that into the model to try to get a feel for it. And so he's sort of, it's a discovery process. He's trying to discover what the project is telling him, a higher sense of openness. He's, very, he's not like rushing to a form. He's, he's coming from a much more rarefied perspective. So a typical day for him is atypical. That's what he wants. So when he talks, when people talk to him, um, he's draw, always drawing something. And sometimes his, if you ask him a question, he draws the answer and shows it to you. He's not necessarily completely invested on this plane. He makes furniture out of cardboard. Uh, he made a hat for Lady Gaga. 
but then was too shy to give it to her. Um, he designs all kinds of interesting things. He's an artist as well as an architect, and he thinks <laughs> architects are artists. Now, so he takes all of these abstract ideas and thoughts and forms and starts to mold them into um, a form that can be actually built. But as you might have guessed, somebody has to build this. So we can all make wild and crazy shapes of, of things, but who's going to be able to build it? I mean, does, is it going to take a bunch of artists, and then will it be structurally sound? I mean, how will that work? So um, he, um, as mentioned, connected with an airplane company that built airplane forms with this software and adapted it to buildings so that he could do a very, very complicated um, uh, project and the software will turn it into a form that can be manufactured. So first of all, they can get somebody to build it, but second of all, from what I've read, there are a lot of overrides in, in architectural projects, sometimes 50, 15 to 20%. So, you know, if you're building a $500 million project, that's chunk change. Once he started sort of perfecting and developing um, this software, his overrides went to 0%, no overrides. And he could get accurate bids and he could get builders to do it, and things really started to take off. How? Well, um, you have to use um, Bezier surfaces. I'm going to talk about what that means in just a second. So that you can actually mold a shape, so to speak, inside of a cube. And then it has an X, Y, and a Z coordinate. And that we've got tools now that can shape things in accordance. Now, um, a lot of times he'll use, you know, thousands and thousands of sheets of stainless steel or titanium. And so it's a matter of manufacturing each one of those, you know, and then taking to the site and applying them. So it's a, like a living skin to the building. They also do um, mock-ups um, in, in sort of the backyard of the studio. And, and you can see one there. How will this actually work? How will we conform the windows and, and um, the skin of the building to the frame? And he has a mock-up, and they do like you know uh, various architectural testing, structural testing, so that when they pitch the project and start getting bids, they can just take the builders there and show them here's here's how this will work. Um, so let's talk a little bit about wh what we're talking about here with the Bezier curve. So now you'll notice the curve is being generated, but there are, this is a cubic, so there's three points that are being manipulated to generate these curves. And the P points, P sub zero and so forth, they can also be changed. And you can go from generating a curve to a design or from a design to a curve. You can go backwards and forwards. There are more complex curves. This is a fifth order, meaning there's, there's five points at work. And you can see how these, these um, shapes can be formed. So Frank can be doing things like crumpling paper or forming cardboard or Sometimes he'll take wax board or aluminum or any number of things, cardboard, and put tape on it. And then when he gets the shape he wants, he can translate it into one of these curves using the software. That can then be sent to the builder. The builder can manufacture it. So here's an example of that. On the left-hand side, you'll see a handmade shape, and you can see there's like tape on it, and it's, so, I don't know what it is, some kind of cardboard maybe. So he's just working on it, you know, um, and she's just shaping it, and come back later, shape it some more, shape it some more, until he gets it the way that he wants it. And then you can do a 3D scan, 
and the scan turns it into sort of a wire mesh, which then can be tuned with the software, sent to the manufacturer, and applied to the building. And it works perfectly. And there's 0% override. And now, so what I've read, obviously I'm not an architect, but from what I've read, a number of builders use something like this now as a way of making more efficient uh, buildings and so forth. So, uh, you know, recently I went to the dentist and uh, I was quizzing him and said, you know, you really need to get a 3D printer so you can start making your own teeth right in the office. Four dentists, like I just quiz them and push them. But anyway, so he got one and then I had to get a crown. So I went in, he ground down the tooth, took a 3D picture of my mouth and the software extrapolated a tooth and then he had an actual printer right there and put like a cube of porcelain there and printed it out Put some glue on the bottom, new tooth. <laughs> Simply awesome. Simply awesome. <laughs> can you do hips? Can you do? Yeah. All right. So, um, so Frank um, is widely recognized, and he won the American uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. And if you look. Uh, just to his left, Robert Redford, Diana Ross, Bill Gates is there, all these various people. And President Obama uh, is, is giving him this award. And this is what uh, Obama said. Frank, never limited by conventional material styles or processes, Frank Gehry's bold and thoughtful structures demonstrate architecture's power to induce wonder and revitalize community. From his pioneering use of technology to the dozens of awe-inspiring sites that bear his signature style, to his public service as a citizen artist, through his work with turnaround arts, Frank Gehry has proven himself as an exemplar of American innovation. That's saying something. That's really saying something. Because Americans are known for innovation. And he's the exemplar of American innovation. Bravo, Frank. Bravo. Uh, so let's follow his path a little bit. This is a, a bridge that he, a pedestrian bridge that he built in um, Chicago, actually. And uh, as he says, you won't get there faster on this bridge, but you'll get there better. And I just couldn't agree more. That the, the design is as important as the function. And so if you walk across this bridge and you're in a better frame of mind when you get to the other side of it, that's magical. So let's take it, take it back. Where is all this stuff coming? What's his path? What's his bridge? So let's start here. I, I just love this picture because that's Frank in the, in the center, and he really doesn't look too much different today. Those are his grandparents. And um, they, he attributes a lot of, of his success in, in life to, to their care. The grandma, her job was to shape a metal into various shapes at a factory. And um, they're a Jewish family. So uh, during the holidays, his mother, his grandmother would bring um, cod home and put it in the bathtub. And Frank was just, you know, fascinated by seeing all these fish in the bathtub. And then they'd make it into uh, kefelta fish, which is one of their traditional dishes. And she would also spend a lot of time with him um, working with blocks, building things you know, deconstructing things, rebuilding. And his grandfather ran a hardware store where Frank often went and was interested in materials and how they work and uh, are they ductile or how do I shape it or what kind of tools. So he was surrounded by certain influences when, when he was a child. And um, 
you know, I, we all have to be grateful. If there's some, you know, positive ability that we have, it's likely that somebody in our life helped us get there. Uh, a parent, a brother, a friend, something. And so, you know, when, when we think about it, we might have just a shade of gratitude for that. Now, um, he talks a lot about rejection and criticism. Things that none of us really like and even try to avoid, but if you're going to design, you're going to discover that criticism is a real thing. And that's, they go hand in hand. So he, you know, um, was actually driving a truck and he decided he'd take a ceramics class. And he was enjoying the class and the teacher was, uh, took an interest in him and said, you know, Frank, um, I think you have an inclination towards architecture. And so he sort of, you know, set the path in motion for him to go to architecture school and where he went. And during the second year, the professor pulled him aside and said, Frank, I don't think you're cut out for architecture. <laughs> I just don't think you're the guy for this. And Frank said, well, what do you learn from that? What you learn is that you've just got to be strong. You've got to have conviction. You've got to have will and just keep going. He said it would have been really easy just to cave. Here's a big, you know, hulking authority rejecting me and so forth. And he said, no, he just, he just wouldn't. He wouldn't quit. And he's interesting, uh, he said that the professor works at LAX doing something now, and he sees him from time to time. And every time he sees him, the guy says, you know, Frank, I think I might have been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so moral of the story, part of um, design, who's anybody else to say what we can and can't do? If we think we can do it, stick with. And that's a big takeaway from him. Um, so he went after architecture school to France for, I think, a year and worked with uh, Le Corbusier, but obviously I don't know French, and architect, designer, painter. And what he sort of liked about him is that he integrated a lot of different disciplines. He wasn't just segmented. I'm just an artist. I'm just an architect. I'm just a designer. He had all of them going uh, at the same time. Frank got a lot from him and was inspired by him. And one of the things that he really felt was important about building was that the building wasn't just functional, that it's a powerful notion that you can transmit emotion through a material. We don't hear that much. The idea that a building can have feeling, emotion, and emotion, that it can change our perception, that's wild. That's just wild to think that you can actually do that. And so he liked to travel, and he liked the arts. He did a lot of art. And one day, he took a trip to Delphi in Greece. And he found the uh, charioteer in Delphi. And, and what he realized, he had a flash. He said, there's a possibility for transmitting humanity through inert materials over the ages. And when he saw this, which was des um, designed and built 500 BCE, he realized that you can build something or do something that will inspire people for thousands and thousands of years. And, and he felt like that he should try to embody this in architecture. And our architecture should exude uh, friendship and community and positive feeling. And he was just so moved by this. Also, he was moved by Bernini, the um, sculptor and artist. 
and that the folds in, in his work was evocative because he felt the fold was like a baby in its mother's fold. And that's like our first experience in life, being connected, being loved, uh, warmth, nourished, cared for. And, and he feels like this is a primeval feeling that when we see it, we have a certain identity with it. And he was just so moved by that. Also, he took an interest in um, these uh, Edo period screens from Japan because they had an asymmetry. And that this free-flowing asymmetry um, was not imposing. One of the things he talks about, people don't want to be told what to do. Bunch of signs everywhere. Do this, do that, sit down, something. No, it should be non-impositional. It should feel natural and organic. And so the asymmetry speaks to that. And that's one of the ways that nature works. Also, the Elgin marbles, uh, which adorn the Parthenon and different buildings in Greece, they're called the Elgin marbles because they were collected by Thomas Bruce, who was the Earl of Elgin, and he collected them and brought them back to England. <laughs> Greece is saying, what happened to our marbles, uh, Mr. Bruce? Uh, but, but so they're in a British museum, and he feels like these are marble, but they bring a kind of life. The building exudes a kind of life from these marbles. So it, it, it's interesting some of the things that have influenced and say they form this almost like archetypal base in his mind of sort of the motion of life, if you will, how he sees it. Now, he didn't really like the architecture of the time. Um, you know, he, he just felt like postmodernism was just not the way to go and people were making junk. He said only 2% of the architecture since um, um, in the century was, or since, since I think World War II, was even valid as architecture, just 2%. The rest of it is junk, although he used a different word. And um, so he went to a lecture, and they were talking about it, and then he just, he just had an insight, and he blurted out, Wait a second, wait a second. If you're going to go back and start mimicking, you know, Greek temples, stuff like that, why don't you go all the way back? Why don't you go back 300 million years? Why don't you go back to fish? So what that means is if you, here's a, you know, geological timetable, and the fish was evolved about 300 million years ago. And everybody's like, what do you mean go back to fish? What are we supposed to do with that? So... He wasn't sure himself. He said he didn't know where it came from. He didn't know why he said that or anything. But he started sketching fish. And he says, fish are millions of years old, and they look architectural. But the key was translating that movement into a building. This is where it really gets interesting. He starts really connecting the dots here. You know, it's not about a literal fish. It's what the fish symbolizes. And so then he starts to make sculptures. And he's illuminating them from within. And so light is coming out of some of the pores and scales. So he starts making a whole series of fish lamps. So he's doing this art. He doesn't have an, any idea how to translate this into architecture yet. But this is, this is what his design is doing for him. This design is like almost like heating up his mind, and then things are starting to move, and he's making extraordinary connections that we wouldn't otherwise make. He's making discoveries. And then he goes a little farther and starts to make more interesting, and, and, and galleries are starting to invite him you know, to submit his work. He's very, very talented as an artist. And he loves artists. He says, I don't like to talk to architects because, well, 
They're so critical, and it just bums me out. But if I talk to artists, they never do that. They're into process. They're into that's interesting. They're into maybe we could go in this direction. So he's sort of fusing together these two elements. Then he goes a little farther with it and starts making really big fish. And then he said, well, what is it about the fish, actually? What if I took the head of the fish and the tail of the fish off? What would that do for us? And that's the 1992 Barcelona Olympics fish. Anybody who follows the Olympics and is old enough to remember 1992, that was an amazing thing. And it, people really liked it. You know, it was over 150 feet long. And it was the first time he was able to use the software that we talked about earlier to design something, send it to the builders and the manufacturers, and they were able to build a perfect replica of it using this new technology. So on several fronts, there was a real, real breakthrough. And um, does anybody actually remember that? No. OK. <laughs> All right, now, um, he says really interesting things that help him, because people are always asking him basically the same question over and over and over again. Like, how do you get your inspiration, blah, blah, blah. And he says, it's kind of like throwing things out and then following the ideas, rather than predicting what you're going to do. So it's from the invisible to the visible. It's not starting with a form. And this involves all kinds of things, but he's very well known for reaching a point in the development where he does a rough sketch, and the sketch embodies the building in a way that's extremely unusual, and I'm going to show you several of those in a minute. And then he says, you know, if you try to understand my buildings according to the perspective point of view, the structural coherence or formal definitions, certainly you will be disappointed. So the shapes that he starts with, as exemplified in that picture, really don't look like a building until he further develops it. But he's coming from this deep organic space. So that begs the question, what is his design philosophy? It really doesn't look like it's a form. It looks like sort of an explosion of motion and things. So he said early on, he started asking really wild questions. Can a fly stop a plane? So in physics, it's like one thing is mass, but the other thing is, is the rate or, or the motion of an object. And they can sort of cancel each other out. So a very small object, if going fast enough, can actually stop a very large object, if not going quickly. And he said, you know, he started posing a lot of questions that were unanswerable. But because he's from the Jewish tradition and studied the Talmud, the first thing that's posed in the Talmud is why. Why anything? That you take this posture of mind not I know, but I don't know, but that doesn't mean I can't know. That was his sort of perspective. And another place he says, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's kind of an interesting state. Nobody likes to be uncomfortable. He says he's uncomfortable all the time, but he's comfortable with that. What? And then he says, um, this isn't about, about architecture. This is about making people happier, making people build fewer fences, and stop buying guns. That's, that's sort of like his mission in life. And he says, you know, he doesn't do anything that's automated or formulated. Everything he does is connecting to humanity. And another analogy would be, he says, it's like jazz. If you're going to play in a jazz quartet, you just get your instrument, you, know, you pick up a note, and you improvise. So 
He says it all starts with this unknown and that he advises students, everybody, he says, find your own voice, find your voice. Don't mimic other people's voice. Don't replicate what I've built, build something according to your own. Um, I was thinking, well, how many ways there can there be? And I was watching a little thing this morning about the seed bank in uh, Norway. And there's like 125,000 different seeds for wheat. <laughs> so the idea is diversity really is really diverse. And um, he also says, you know, the old architecture had to do with power. And the new architecture has to do with friendship, community, and feeling. Just beautiful. Completely different orientation. And he says, you know, I can't control it. I don't really know where it's coming from. When it's ready, it starts to appear to me. And he says, trust it and don't overthink things so much. Um, and then he says, finally, I have no idea what I'm really doing. But he said, if there was a mistake that he made early on, it was he took criticism for weakness early on and uh, changed his style because he felt like, you know, that was a sign that he didn't know what he was doing. And he said if he was going to go back and change one thing, that would be it. That when you're feeling weak or, or disoriented, it doesn't mean you're necessarily on the wrong track. It means that this process is still growing. It's just beautiful, beautiful. I really am studying really sort of felt this deep kinship and that he was talking about me and everybody else, not just architecture. So the, the sketches um, that I had mentioned earlier um, sort of encapsulate the, the, the project. And he builds from the inside out. That's another thing. So he doesn't, he doesn't build to make something look nice. It's like, what's the essence of this? And what should the outer garment of it be to most fully be conducive to what we want it to do? So the first really big project that he did that's noteworthy is this. He had a, just a regular you know, place in uh, Santa Monica, like you see everywhere. And he sort of tore it apart and rebuilt it. It was sort of the beginning of this, what's called deconstructionist architecture, where you, you, you're, you're sort of, the statement is that conformity isn't really something that we really want to do. What if we just tore it apart, re-envisioned it, rebuilt it with different angles, exposed various beams, and used conventional materials that, that like corrugated metals or chain link fence or you know asphalt or plywood, just really conventional things. And then the design is what puts it together and makes it into something, not the materials, but the design. And uh, so the inside of the building, you know, looks something like that with a lot of exposed beams. The outside, I would not call that an attractive building, but it was sort of his deviation from convention to build this bigger idea that was to come. Really interesting. The first steps at design maybe look like a bomb, but a necessary step to go up the ladder. And you have to have a lot of strength to be able to do that. Well, this actually, although criticized, was quite popular after a certain point and really sort of triggered a lot of other things that he started to do. There's the inside of the building. And um, I don't like it, <laughs> but who cares? You know, it's OK. And um, they had a, a museum exhibit at uh, LA County Museum of Art on Frank Gehry, and they had all the models, you know, there that, that he used. Oh, it was just really something to see. The Guggenheim. Now, when you look at that, you might 
see something you might not. But if you study the Guggenheim for a while, this is more the Guggenheim than the Guggenheim. I don't know why. It just captures it in just the right way because probably it comes straight from his imagination and that's always going to be more pure than anything in the material realm. So, um, so he builds this um, building and um, they call him to go to Bilbao. And um, so he does go and um, they say to him, we want you to build um, a structure that will do for Bilbao what the Sydney Opera House did for Sydney. We want this building to draw tourists. We want it to draw businesses. We want people to upgrade the area. We want it to be the showcase of everything and um, make it as cheaply as you can. But uh, that's what we want. Can you do that? And he said, I can try. And they said, we want to put it up right over here. And they had like sort of a hill. And he said, he looked at it and he said, no, it'll never go there. You need to put it down there. It's like a shipyard or something. And so Bill Bow, as he describes it, was like Detroit. It used to be steel, shipbuilding, and then all that stuff somehow was was not occurring in Bilbao, and they had basically a bunch of junk around. So he, he built this, and uh, he used the software. This is the first time he used the software to adapt the fish idea to an actual building. And that's how it came out. And it's wildly popular. And it did actually improve Bilbao. In fact, it was so popular that it's referred to as the Bilbao effect. And cities all over the world call on him and they say, we want the Bilbao effect. Just make something that will do what it did there. So he was able to build this for, I think, $300, $300 a square foot. So it was really cheap. And, um, and it drew in, in the first uh, years, 4 billion euros of tourist um, money and businesses coming into town and all kinds of trade that went on. He actually used titanium for the sides of the building. And it was interesting. It's like, well, why titanium? And he said he experiments with materials and he had a sheet of titanium and he, was, he hung it outside of the office and noticed that when it rained or when it was a gray day, that it had a creamy gold color. It was very unusual, and he just loved it. But it's expensive. And he said uh, during the project, they, um, the Russians dumped some huge quantity of titanium on the market so he could get it cheaply. And so he used titanium for his project. Inside, equally amazing, if not more so, the curvature. Bezier surfaces. There's a lot to each one of these, but uh, clearly I've got to get through some material. So uh, the Disney Concert Hall, uh, a, a must see if you can go there. Dudamel is the conductor there. And they do, it's the most beautiful concert hall. The LA Philharmonic is arguably the best Philharmonic in the world. And um, this, he said, was sort of built to sort of turn music into architecture. But he said, you know, uh, sometimes it's said that architecture is frozen music. He said, but not in my book. In this case, architecture is like large billowing sails that are in motion. And it's like different overtures of music playing by the symphony, you know, turned into visual forms and merging together in a sort of beautiful display. And the curvature is remarkable. And when you go inside, it looks something like this. And the acoustics are just splendid. Um, and there's an organelle in the background. We're going to talk about that in a second. This is just a view of it. You know, there's a concert hall, but there's also, um, you know, little areas for mini concerts or lectures and, and various things. 
And when you go into the building, you really feel like different. You just feel really, really different. Um, you know, you're always going like this and looking around. People are bumping into things. It's amazing. This is the organelle, um, which he says he, he visualized it as being a cluster of flowers shooting out from the ground. And it has 128 stop controls to play it. But each one has to be t tuned individually, and it takes 30 minutes to do each one because you play that particular note, I guess. And then you have to walk all around the concert hall. It takes 30 minutes, and then adjust it if necessary. Uh, H. Spruce Street is a skyscraper in New York City. Boy, talk about a tough assignment. And they wanted something um, different. And so, you know, he's got all these buildings there, and they're all, as you've been to New York, they're all just these power structures. Everything's basically a box, but really tall. It's really not that appealing. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, he thought, well, you know, maybe what I should do is employ the folds of Bernini on this one, and that the building will... It'll be a skyscraper, it's 76 stories high, and, and it'll have these folds, so it will be inviting to people, and I'll make the color sort of reflect the East River. And um, it's right next to the Woolworth building, which, which you can see the, the building with the copper um, roof on it. And he said, um, out of deference to the Woolworth building, he did not put a cap on eight spruce it was a way of bowing to the Woolworth building. Even though it was smaller, it was the giant of its time. And he feels like it's not about competition, it's about cooperation. And um, so, you know, that's the skyline of New York City. And that um, depicts better, a little better, those are both Bernini sculptures, and you can sort of see that in, in the architecture. I really like it. I, I just really like it. Uh, not that that matters, but... Um, and, and then he talks about creative blocks. And um, well, what about that? You know, like if you're doing things, what if you get blocked? You're a writer, you're a designer, you're anybody, and, you're, and you just feel like, ah, I just can't, blah, blah, blah. Well, he's very clear about this. He says, that is totally inexcusable. He said, we're always blocked, but that we make breakthroughs from time to time because we just keep on trying. That's what work is. Don't give me this excuse that you're blocked. He says, no. And further, that the, the whole process is primitive and magical and an exciting process of unfoldment. And then he goes on to say, well, Henry James put it best. He said, creativity is like having a really big stick, and then there's a big barrel filled with stuff, and you stir the barrel, and every once in a while you pull up the stick, and there's something on it. And that's your new idea. And you always have to work, and you never give an excuse for not working and not trying. Ooh, I had to sit down for a while. Actually, I was sitting down, but still. <laughs> sit, sit down. Uh, Louis Vuitton, Paris. So at this point, I've got a bunch more stuff, but I have to speed up. Um, these are billowing sails in Paris. And this is like, um, for him, an not deconstructive, but expression of unity and singularity. And again, this is like a sailing theme, which is, is sort of easy to see. Um, then um, he, he's created a sort of tension between the inside of the building and the outside. And he said, if you look in the center of that, there's like a large white sort of structure, which he refers to as an iceberg. So you've got billowing sails surrounding an iceberg. And um, he said he, he envisioned this when he was driving and on airplanes, but he would just dream a lot. And he, he remembered that his father told him, Frank, you're a dreamer. You'll never get anywhere by dreaming. And then he says, I think my father underestimated dreaming. 
Because there's fantasy dreaming, but there's also contemplation. Whoa, 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 wait a second. They're not both dreams? No. No, 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 no. There's a higher degree of contemplation, like an abstract state, that he seems to have reached. And then he can draw down from that. When people ask him, how? He says, it's all intuition, all of it. Well, well, but what are the steps? There aren't steps. You work on it, and then you rely on this inner state, and it evolves from that. This is the inside of the building. There's a little waterfall there. And a couple other shots of, you know, there's like a standing pool of water. But, you know, the magnificence of it is just stirring. Another shot of the inside. The Museum of Biodiversity in Panama, very interesting. And um, this is one of the few buildings that he does with a lot of color. And the idea is the roof lines represent tectonic plates because Panama, you know, is right at the convergence of North and South America. And that four million years ago, it sort of came together. And the museum is designed to uh, express the biodiversity of the area. And it's the um, first museum on Earth about the importance of biodiversity. Uh, it was also built to capture the Bilbao effect, which apparently it did. Very unusual building. Different, but really different. Um, this is in Hong Kong via Opus, and it's designed as a kind of bundle of, of sticks or bamboo that, that he built. And it's a very large building up, up on a hill. Not everything he does has that big sweeping curve to it. But this does really look like sort of bamboo swaying in the, in the wind or, or reeds swaying in the wind. And these are some more conventional buildings. In, uh, these are in, ones in Germany and ones in Manhattan. The Dancing House, we talked a little bit about this. And this ha is obviously a deconstructionist, but it's in the Czech Republic where there's a lot of Art Nouveau and Baroque and Gothic architecture. But um, this particular site was bombed out in 1945 in a World War II uh, bombing raid. And so they wanted to rebuild something there very different. And as, they, as he puts it, there's um, a sort of a, a dynamic and static element here or male and female. I think the curve is the female um, energy. And, and the idea is to not be communists, to embrace democracy, to sort of renew our whole system as a way of, of aspiring to something greater, and that this would be sort of a symbol of that. Um, and so it's meant to be disruptive um, and, and a, a kind of tension. So it's taking standard you know, shapes and volumes that we're all used to and then tweaking them. So when you take ge geometry when you're younger, it's not about geometry. Uh, what does a student once say, what is all this about? Nobody grows up to be a geometrist. And I said, everybody does. Everybody. Because you can't really think unless you have these fundamental, well, building blocks. It's just a beautiful building, this, this uh, sweeping. And then um, <clears throat> this one I, I, I really like, the Lou Ruvo Center in Las Vegas. Um, and he's got, you know, kind of just a, a bunch of kind of odd shaped blocks which he made in the back. <laughs> and uh, it's really fun. It's an Alzheimer's research center. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
yeah. And again, Bill Bow effect to revitalize downtown Las Vegas. Uh, he's sort of whimsical in a statement about our minds in a certain way, that we can't build a structure. It's different than that. Um, it's part off office building, but, but there's also research being done there. Um, and he built, he didn't want to build the building, but, but he's a very compassionate man. And, and he said, I, I, you know, if this is going to help and heal people, then I want to help. And just the remarkable structure, just love it. And the interior looks something like that. But then there are hallways where there are offices. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like a puzzle house, right? And then <clears throat> he built something in uh, Ar Arles, France, mostly known for Van Gogh, who spent time there. But for whatever reason, uh, you know, he, he wanted to take this uh, famous painting, Starry Night, and build something out of that. And he thought, what's a way that I can get light to reflect off the building in different ways all day long so that it's like a living painting based on, on the light, was one way that he put it. Um, he said it's a way to challenge the mundane and do something completely different. Um, so he builds this and comes up with a building like that. So it's sort of, sort of like basically a bag of rocks or minerals that you know he turns into a building. And you know this is a town that's been around for 3,000 years. You know there were Romans and Greeks there and so forth. But he said there's a mountain range nearby. I want it to reflect the mountain range. And then on the interior he built double helix. Um, it's a large, 184 feet high, 11,000 panels. And um, he, he wanted it to sort of give a modern rendition to um, uh, Van Gogh's star, a Starry Night. So, so as you walk around the village and so forth, the building reflecting the light changes constantly and reflects in different ways, uh, such like that. And then the windows are offset from the building. There's a structure there. Where is this? This is in France, Arles, France. You want to go to MIT? Here's your school. He, he built this as a way of challenging the mundane and that people that go to MIT who are very brilliant should be thinking in different ways and the building should even reflect that. He called it irreverent play and messy vitality. Um, using whimsical shapes to sort of get people to sort of think differently. And, you know, it's sort of stunning. Um, I don't like it, but I'm not going to MIT. And he's got something in there called um, the uh, infinite the infinite corridor. This is like a river that runs through the whole space with all kinds of different art and tables and places where people would meet. And you could even have a little class over onto the side. And um, it's just sort of like play almost. And then the, the last project with Frank is the LA River project. As I mentioned, it was an actual river, is an actual river, but basically it's concrete and uh, I don't know, you know, what, what are we supposed to do with this thing? So they contacted Frank and said, you tell us, because Frank has been identified as being something called a third space thinker. What is a third space thinker? That's a person who can take into consideration not just the material elements, but what are the cultural elements? What are the social elements? What are the environmental elements? What are the aesthetics? What is the design? What's around it? What is it, how should it be represented? That there's a sort of like a, a merging of all these elements, like a 360 degree way of thinking 
where you actually come from the inside out with a design that will work for that space. And at USC Architecture School, that is what they try to teach, and Frank Gehry is the exemplar of that kind of thinking. So they contacted him and uh, said, you know, I mean, really, this is just a challenging project. What are we supposed to do with this? So it's this river, as I say, it's an actual regular river that runs through the particular area. And so what you know, he wants to do is build sort of spaces over the top of it and then reuse the water. So you, so you can see the flow of the river and above it would be a green space. And the green space would merge to other green spaces and that communities could, could then use this as uh, a nature resource. So they're still planning it, but that's sort of the idea. All right, so let's transition here to none other than Johnny Ive. And um, as mentioned, uh, Johnny is a British man who has a very unusual perspective and could say he shaped the way we use technology and look at technology. And the influences in his life really are like an alignment of planets. So Johnny's, his father was a big influence and a designer, he was a silversmith. Dieter Ram, or Ram, is a, a German um, designer. And then Steve Jobs had a tremendous influence on him. So it, the parade of products that he's influenced and designed is considerable. And I'm wearing the watch. I have a phone in my pocket. I have two computers here. And they're all designed by Johnny. And every day I say, I love this. Because I started in computers when there was one computer at the college. One. And it was just horrible experience. Um, and now it's easy. And now it's coming to where we'll only talk to our phones and computers. It's just so loving this. And this is where Daniel will help us, I'm sure. And he said, there is beauty when something works, and it works intuitively. Frank said that. Frank said, he doesn't know. It all comes from the intuition. I work on things. I agitate things. I stir things. And then it comes into view, and it's there. But I'm not sure how it got there. Johnny says the same thing. He works really hard on all kinds of things, and then it just flows through his intuition. So, you know, probably the original experience most of us went through was something like that, where you're just trying to figure out what, you know, where's the handle, what do I do, that kind of thing. Engineers aren't particularly good at designing things for humans all the time. So Johnny came in and turned it into a different experience altogether. And in his youth, he was most influenced by his father. And his father was a silversmith and designer. And Johnny would always look forward you know, to going to the shop and learning and different things. But he said, you know, when I was young, I really struggled to read. He was his, hap he was his happiest being left to daydream with a sketch pad or to watch his father at work. But for, for a fairly early on, I was labeled and described as an unsuccessful student. What's the one word that describes the student? Dyslexic. He was dyslexic. So he wanted to draw. He wanted to design. He did like physics and he did like chemistry. But he struggled reading. Very, very high IQ. And, and his good friend and collaborator Steve Jobs was also dyslexic. So it really says something. You know, it's at one level, it's a disability, but is it? If you work anyway, uh, we, think, we think not necessarily. We were still just learning. Um, his father was into uh, silver, a silver craftsman, silversmith. And there are all kinds of interesting qualities about silver that Johnny picked up really early. He loves silver, still does. 
These are two of his favorite silver um, objects that he keeps by his desk, his penguin, and this you know, exquisitely um, crafted cutlery. But he said a silver has to do with transformation and mysticism. And that if you want to be a designer, you have to hold the materials, learn the material from the inside out. That these materials are alive, they're vibrant, and they're shapeable. But you have to become aware of kind of their living realities. Again, I just had to sit down. Uh, I was already sitting down, but I had to do a double sit because those sorts of things kind of say it all. So this design school, he, he went to school, and there's a lot of criticism for designers of today because he says, you know, pressing control P and then printing out something on a 3D printer is not designing. He says you have to make things in the lab with your hands. You need a knowledge of the material, and that there's a lot of limits to digital design, and that everybody needs way more practical experience, um, and that when you really design something that's a real thing, it's simple, cohesive, and it seems like it appeared spontaneously. Not a labored process, a flowing process. Um, and then he says, you know, elegance in objects is everybody's right, and it shouldn't cost more than something that's ugly. Uh, and Steve Jobs said that all the time. To make something truly beautiful doesn't cost much more and doesn't take that much more time, but that's what we need to do. Dieter Rams, who is a sort of well-renowned in the design world, uh, he worked for Brown, a German company. You know, they make all kinds of kitchen stuff and so forth. And he set down what he thought were 10 rules for design. And uh, when Johnny saw this, he really was taken aback and sort of like started involving himself deeply in the philosophy of design and, and what is a good design. So after um, graduating from design school, he got hired by a company, Tangerine. They sent him to Silicon Valley in the 80s, was just getting started. And they had a project, they were working with some company in Silicon Valley, they went some fruit name, oh yeah, Apple. And he went there and delivered a project and started talking to them and they said, well, would you like to work at Apple? And he said, yeah, I'll work at Apple. And then he, he just fell right into it. It was almost like some kind of weird destiny. And he loves San Francisco and um, he lives, in, he lives in North Beach, and he just walks around doing all kinds of stuff. When I go there, you know, we have to like try to seek him out. I would just love to just, just see him and kind of talk to him, but probably have me arrested. Um, so anyway, when he, once he goes to Apple, he meets what he refers to as a kind of soulmate, Steve Jobs. Nobody got along with Steve Jobs. If he didn't like your work, he'd just turn your desk over. It was difficult but they were a match made in heaven. And, and they would meet every day for lunch. And he said, often we'd just sit quietly. And we wouldn't do anything. We'd just sit quietly. But often we'd talk. And he said, Steve told me, when you make something with care, even though you don't know who the people using it will be, they'll sense it. Care is a way to express our love for the species. Uh, and he said, I clicked with Steve, and when I met Steve, I clicked with him in a way that I had never before done with someone and never have since. Now, he, uh, Johnny hated computers until he used a Macintosh, which Steve built. And then he said, oh, wait a second. I can connect with this. There's design in here. There's a better way to do all of this. So the two of them became fast collaborators. Um, and uh, he, he referred his time with them as sanctuaries in the studios. They were the, some of the happiest, most creative and joyful times in my life. And I loved how he saw the world. The way he thought was profoundly beautiful. 
So when uh, uh, Steve Jobs passed, um, as uh, people attending the memorial exited, everybody was given a, uh, a package and it had like plain, plain brown wrapper. And everybody was wondering, well, what's, what's in it? What did he get? What must be really, really important? He gave everybody something as his last gift. And it was autobiography of a yogi that um, Steve traveled to India and um, had a lot of interest in sort of the spiritual side of things and went to a lot of different temples. He uh, spent time meditating in a Zen meditation group and he had studied a lot of these things, but he never really talked about it. Nobody really knew any of this stuff. And so um, it was just a way, um, and, 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 uh, and he said, um, Johnny said, and he had this incredible realization that his intuition was the greatest gift that he had and that he needed to, to look at the world from the inside out. Those are the kind of things they talked about. Um, <clears throat> and so he was never really distracted by money or power. Uh, and Johnny says, after he passed, I walked out into the garden. I remember the sound of the latch <clears throat> on the wooden door as I gently pulled it closed. In the garden, I sat and thought how talking often gets in the way of listening and thinking. Perhaps that's why so much of our time together was spent quietly. So um, <clears throat> the principles that Johnny used was the less, the better. It should have a strong function, but no more than necessary, and that the design should actually get out of the way. So if you take, say, the iWatch, it's like not really a watch. It's sort of an organic thing, at least for me. And um, so much care is taken. And um, he had a team of designers working for him and they had three sort of like scouts. And these scouts would go all over the world looking for the premier designers in the world. And they'd find one per year and hire them. So they'd hire one designer a year after this, this deeply rigorous process. Um, you know, iPods. And then he, <laughs> he, he has his own company now. And he works in San Francisco. And he, they make they make just things. And so uh, Bono from U2, he does this sort of uh, red auction to try to raise money for charities. And so Johnny makes something for it. And he made this ring. It's the whole ring is diamond. So you know you can you can manufacture diamond now in, in, in machines. So he had that done and then he had it crafted so that it's a full ring diamond and has 3,000 facets to it, one single piece. And, um, and then he sold it at this auction, Bono's auction, for a quarter of a million dollars. He said, leave room for the magic of intuition. So um, again, it's, he doesn't, like Frank, he doesn't like want to tell people what to do. It's like inviting an experience to occur not putting a bunch of arrows and signs everywhere. Or for that matter, a lot of words, because words can connote things that maybe symbols don't in the same way. And so he designed the operating system, which has been a smashing success. And very rarely do, do, do people have to use instruction manual, once in a while, but not that often. And um, he got into skeuomorphism. So the idea is the old way was to take an object like, I don't know, like a bookshelf on the bottom right. And then you press on that and you know you're going to get a bunch of books. But, but that's skeuomorphism. So instead of doing that translation piece, use a more direct symbol. So instead of a photo of a flower, have a bunch of colors that are in all photos. Or instead of tickets, have sort of a filing system. And it's a smoother transition. Again, he works at a very subtle level, so very, very, very subtle. And he said, when he works, 
language and curiosity blend. So rather than start sketching a bunch of things, he has conversations. And these conversations form sort of an environment out of which eventually things can actually start to precipitate. But you don't force the precipitation. You sort of set it in motion at a very subtle level. And so he doesn't really get to the sketch for, for quite a while. He spends a lot of time just thinking and talking. And he said, when you start to design, be careful about words. So for instance, um, he says, the power of words are strong. Language is so powerful. If I say I'm going to design a chair, think how dangerous that is. Because you've just said chair. You just said no to a thousand ideas. Oh, oh. You framed it in a way that made it go in a direction that blocked the design of it. So what are you supposed to say? Well, he hired a wordsmith. So he works with a group of people, and they talk. And the wordsmith crafts it into words that don't suggest specific objects, but suggest specific endeavors without defining it. And that's what this person does. They just write that out. Notice that they're sitting on chairs that have multi-functions, which he designed. Useful. You know, he came up with this menu item where, where you can sort of squirrel the various apps on a very, very small screen. And now that AI com is coming out, this will be built into a lot of things. It's just going to be really, it's, it's Wild West time for sure. Um, but he said there's, the user interface should be uh, an easy sense of connection, should multitask, and you shouldn't have to think too hard about it. It should be understandable, meaning that there's a hierarchical operating system that works across the board. So if you can use one thing, you can use another. It should be unobtrusive. You should like to feel it. If you go to the Apple store, which I sometimes do, and just stand off to the side, almost everybody does the same thing. They pick it up and they go like this. Oh, oh, it just fits. It, and I just stand there and it's like, oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. And then they do a few things and, then, and, and it's so popular. I mean, not that this matters, but how much do you think Apple makes in one day? A billion dollars a day. How many people do they reach? Two billion. All Johnny. So you can argue that he's the most, one of the most popular and influential designers that has ever lived. Here's the camera that he did. He's, one of his principles is thorough to the greatest detail. Every detail, 550 iterations. Oh. Now, this you'll like. He came up with something called the squircle. So instead of a radius as a curve, he came up with the idea of a constantly evolving curve. So the squircle is sort of implies motion. Um, it's a transitional piece, and it gives a softer highlight, and it creates, you know, this is sort of feeling of a continuous curve. You know, most of the time when you look at your device, you won't notice it. But now that you know it, and you look at your device, you say, oh, that is really cool. <laughs> you just feel different. And that's the level he's working at. So, you know, Arthur C. Clarke said, any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And um, the author says, I mentioned this to Johnny, and he told me that they were thinking exactly that when the iPad was going through the studio, and they succeeded. He has an eye. So here's a piece of art that he did modeled after the window of the space shuttle, which he sold at the U2 auction, or the Bono's auction, for $825,000. He only makes one, just one. 
sketchbook tools. He has tremendous admiration of fine tools as an extension of the creative process. So he says, there's a beauty and a joy in the machines and tools. They're no longer solely a means to an end. I think there's an inherent elegance in an effective tool that normally results in a curious beauty. It's just like butter everywhere. I mean, oh, look at that protractor. But most of all, curiosity. <clears throat> curiosity is the most important thing, but success can represent an enemy of curiosity. You can start to think, oh, we've had a big hit with the iPhone or this and that, and then you lose that edge where you're doing new raw things on this kind of like newfound frontier. And so he says, you know, we really have to, to, to keep that edge going with our curiosity. And his dear friend Steve Jobs said, don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. Um, and, and Johnny says, this is where it gets exciting. You have an idea which is unproven and it isn't resolved. Since a resolved idea is a product, and the only tangible thing about the idea are the problems. So when someone says it's not possible, and all you're being shown is why it's not possible, you have to think and behave in a different way. You have to say from a place of courage, I believe it's possible. Again, just like Frank, you've got to like, you know, stare down the phantom, say no. Apple Park, um, <clears throat> it's huge, it's beautiful, um, and I can't go too much into it today, but um, I have a really, really amazing uh, student that I have who works there, and, uh, but they, can, they can't talk about anything there. It's, like it's a kind of like a, a silence environment because of the products they're making. But one of the things they did off to the side was built a uh, theater in honor of Steve Jobs called the Steve Jobs Theater. And it's just beautiful. It's an all glass, but it's structural glass. So it's this sort of temple, if you will. And if you go into the lobby, it looks like that. Um, this was built, and, and a lot of the architecture was done by Foster and Partners. Uh, the roof was pre-built and had to be you know, lifted into place. But if you go into the building, you know, it drops down, and there's an underground uh, theater. I think it houses like 1,000 people, something like that. So that's under the theater. And he's also done um, stores, you know, the Apple stores. He's designed a bunch of those things. And then most recently, uh, he, was, he played a part in the coronation, because he's British, and he's good friends with um, King Andrew. They work together on environmental concerns. So he designed, um, he, he, de he designed the um, symbol for the coronation. And uh, it looks specifically like that. So that's what I have for, for today. We magically made our way. And thank you very much. Well, that was quite a treat. Remarkable, Russ, that you put all that together. So we have um, just a few minutes. We can make take one or two questions, sure. maybe. Yes. My question is. Wait, wait. Uh, we just because we're streaming, we want <laughs> okay. To hear. Since I'm not a a a fan of technology, okay, but I need to know can. We, Someone, can I recommend someone to hear this and see this meeting that we've had today, tomorrow? <laughs> can it be viewed? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, so, uh, like Kirk was mentioning, you know, the Institute has a, a, um, a YouTube channel. So, um, month after month, we have these spectacular presentations. 
and they're all there. So you can just go to youtube.com and go to the Institute webpage, and uh, you can pick up uh, the newsletter, and it has it there, and a person could type that into their computer, and boom, you could watch it over and over and over again. <laughs> Wonderful, it was outstanding, and if you never give another speech, you've made it. Well, you, you, you made my day, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Russ. Um, when you showed the uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and a lot of these, um, a lot of these were from the outside in yeah. because of all the beautiful waves and titanium and yeah. other materials that are used. Yeah, They're yeah. amazing. Um, I had the experience of actually. Uh, the good fortune of listening to Wynton Marsalis oh. and jazz oh. in the concert hall. Oh, boy. And I've also listened to him at Lincoln Center in New York City, in yeah. his home, yeah. as well as Hollywood Bowl outside and <laughs> the Granada Theater here yep. in Santa Barbara. Yep. And what's really interesting out of all these concerts is I remember the concert hall in Los Angeles <laughs> as part of the concert he gave, yeah. that that context was, and it was very warm, yeah. as opposed to the coldness of titanium. Yeah. And it was very holistic, uh, very curvy, uh, and it was really amazing. Yeah. So it's that, he's, that's just a confirmation of what you were saying about how architecture and the built environment can provide not only the function, yeah. but also the aesthetic yeah. and the other thing about the concert hall, and you mentioned this, is the sound system is as integrated yeah. as I've ever heard in any place. <laughs> so the whole thing, the whole experience is not just the jazz, yeah. but the jazz in the context. Yeah. So oh, this yeah. is really amazing. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And I'm, I'm also a Wynton Mar Marsalis fan. Thank you, Russ. When you were showing the picture of New York City, you mentioned that there was something missing. And for me, that something was the greenery, the yeah. nature. Yeah. Well, you look at cities and they tend to be dirty. And yeah. imagine where a scenario in which we could integrate nature into cities, wouldn't they just be, wouldn't we just find soda cans and shrubs and stuff like this? Mm -hmm. In other words, do you think that us as a society are we ready to integrate nature and the well-being of the planet into our architecture? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> what do you think, uh, Kirk? Can you give us any help with that? Can you repeat the question? So, 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 you have the mic. I don't have a mic. So please go ahead. Repeat. Well, we'll get you the mic, uh, and I'll repeat the question while we get it. So the, the question is, you know, if you go to New York City, other places, it's sort of a mess with <laughs> cans and just junk everywhere. But if if we could sort of integrate nature like Facebook did with the roof structure and so forth, could, could, that, could that really help us and are we ready for that? I mean, you know, or what are the steps perhaps that we need to do to be ready for that? Is that a fair rendering? Kirk, what do you think? <laughs> well, there's different ways to kind of respond to that question, I think, and um, really, it, it's a big question. And um, I think what I would say about what Gary was doing was that he was, as Russ, I think, very much brought out in different ways, that he, he, he was trying to um, connect human beings with one another, connect us to our, our better natures. Um, and in that way, you could say that his buildings were and his design process is a way of um, encouraging that within us which is, does, does connect with nature, which does feel part of the natural world. And you know, this whole idea about uh, using a fish as his fundamental design concept, using the natural form of the fish in movement, in curvature, was a way of reminding us that, that that's the way nature works, right? So he was, I think, in, in some ways, that the forms he was using was an attempt to root us uh, deeper, deeper into nature in that sense. That's a very brief answer. But also the, um, 
you know, sort of uh, in contradiction to what we might think, the efficiency of his design, as Russ was also pointing out, that um, the, the design process he came up utilizing computers um, to, so that, that um, the, even the structural parts that would hold these buildings together could, could be designed uh, at their utmost efficiency given all the stresses and functions that they needed to perform and uh, manufactured in, this, in the factory, in fact, um, and then set, sent to the site as like a kit of parts and reassembled on site, um, you know, meeting, meeting budget constraints, meeting time constraints, which is, you know, these buildings are famously way over budget, two, three <laughs> times the, the, you know, original proposed budget, where he was coming in on budget and on time, you know. So there's a tremendous efficiency in that. But there's, there's just a few uh, yeah. ways to talk mm, about that's it. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question about, because you brought up money, <laughs> I was going to ask the question now. But those buildings look expensive. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, when you talk about, um, there's a lot of parts of it yeah. that aren't like functional in a practical sense, aesthetically maybe. So I, this is a question about that. It just seems like that takes a lot of money to create this thing. It does. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's not a poor man's game, but Kirk, could you know how much these things cost? I, I have no idea. I, no, I, I don't. But I, but I, th I think that for, you know, um, the, the types of buildings that he's building, right, um, in, in a large part, um, they're, they're heavily funded, right? So, so um, even if there is a budget presented at the outset, it's a very generous one and has to be. Um, like the Bill Bow Museum, you know, as you mentioned, it's built right on on the river, um, and uh, there was there was all kinds of work that needed to be done to just to uh, prepare the site, um, and a lot of that it can't be discovered beforehand, you know. So there has to be a sort of an unlimited dimension to the budget, um, and uh, and and museums typically, you know, the the other approach. Of course, that he that he brings to architecture is that the building itself is a work of art, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, that you can walk through and use, yeah. and that you're continually being inspired by and challenged by. I mean, that's that's the other thing. His buildings mm -hmm. are very yeah. challenging, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's not. You have to get over the question of whether I like it or not, <laughs> right? No. <laughs> yeah. It's not a question of whether I like it or not. It's a question that it, it leads the mind into questioning, but it also elevates the spirit. That's been my experience anyway. But that doesn't really answer the question about money. <laughs> but 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 hundreds of millions of dollars for many of them. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, first of all, I want to thank Russ for this very, very inspiring uh, presentation. I wish okay. I was a student of yours when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing is, um, I regret to say, I usually don't like Frank Gehry's buildings uh -huh. <laughs> until I go into the Disney concert hall, I have them. Yeah. Because I think architecture is enclosed of space, yeah. play with light. That means you use the enclosed space, but using the natural lighting, mm -hmm. so you enjoy it yourself. Mm -hmm. But when I go into Disney, when I outside, I don't like his building. After I went into and listened to the, it was Beethoven's Nice Symphony, mm -hmm. I guess, I went mm -hmm. there. I start to like his building more, mm -hmm. but most of the building I haven't went inside, so mm -hmm. still a lot. I think he is an artist, and is so lucky he can incorporate architecture into his art. Yeah. His art buildings are mostly like a sculpture, yeah. but it's too big a sculpture. <laughs> with shiny material is really not, to me, it's not connected to nature uh -huh. at all. Uh -huh. If 
if he can invent some materials more close to nature, maybe mm -hmm. I would like his building more. Mm -hmm. But I like it or not, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It is successful, everybody likes yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm. Um, if we could explore without a feel, fear of failure, oh. as he mentioned, and if we realized our interdependence, what kind of building do you see that we could do um, for the future, mm -hmm. starting now? Uh -huh. <laughs> Tailor-made for you. <laughs> you know, w one of the things that uh, Russ also b brought out very well about Gary is that when he was given a commission to do a building, he, he would, um, it would be an investigative process, right? So it would be a question about, first of all, who wants the building? Why, what is the building for? What is the function it's gonna perform? How big does it have to be? What are all the, uh, um, what's the square footage? Roughly, what are we talking about in terms of square footage? How, you know, so, so and then what is the site? Where does the site, um, in fact, the, the, the Bill Bow Museum, as he mentioned, they had selected a site. And after he studied the city, and he did m numerous sketches um, of, of um, sight lines, of the city itself, of uh, street orientations, of other major buildings. And, um, you know, he, he made them change the site location, <laughs> right? And then, uh, what, what, and one of the magnificent things, because we have been to Bilbao, is that as you come into the city, and maybe you saw that bridge that kind of goes over mm -hmm. nearby the building, mm -hmm. as you're coming into the city, uh, on a, in a car, one of the arms of that kind of flowing portion of the building reaches, is like reaching up and you drive right by it and you're looking into the museum <laughs> in your car. <laughs> and it's like the, it's like the paw of a, of a <laughs> animal sort of, you know, right? Reaching towards you. It, it's very, in, in, in a certain way, it's very embracing, yeah. and, but it's also very startling. It's a form you've never seen before. And that's a window, so you're looking into it as well. You know, so it's just so, um, it becomes like this uh, very mysterious, dynamic way to enter the city. But the point, the reason I mention all that <laughs> is because it's not something you don't design. Uh, the design for the concept is not something you can, that arises immediately, right? There's a whole investigative process, learning about, as we mentioned, all the, all the elements that, that need to go into it. And then it's something that starts to percolate from within and it almost answers itself. I think Frank would, would say something like this as well, that it sort of arises out of the, your study and your understanding and the people that it's for and the function it's gonna perform. And then also your, your, your love for nature. It was obviously his love of nature, natural form, that was guiding a lot of his work. Anyway, that's... Uh, uh, partial answer, avoiding the real question. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just a, a couple of mentions. Uh, the next, uh, before we do the vote of thanks, which will be given by Robert, uh, the next event for the Institute is on June 10th. It's a film titled Lincoln, uh, very much worth uh, seeing, even if you've seen it before. And it's here in Concord Hall. And then there's the uh, study circle on Tuesday evenings and the upcoming theme for this week is is contemporary academic science credible mm -hmm. it's a big question uh, and there's a it's a very dynamic group and that can be joined online or here at the Institute so uh, we'll ask Robert Moore please for the vote of thanks yeah well We've heard so much that's beautiful, thoughtful, humane, uh, well uh, studied and thought through. So, not too much I can say, Russ. 
other than that, no one can tell you what you can do. <laughs> you know, the, the ideas, one thing that I think hardly anybody here would argue with are the ideas that Russ brought out that Gary had. And, and likewise, it, it spills over into Johnny in that um, it's going from the, the, our interior experience, our interior consciousness, which is very much connected with our feelings. Mm -hmm. We have feelings, you know, that are chaotic and, and destructive, but we also have feelings that are remarkably uh, uh, deep, uh, intuitional, and uh, all-inclusive. Uh, very, very constructive. And both of these people, as we've seen, that what you brought out, is they're really a remarkable thing is that you see the human being interacting with the creations of the human being. Like uh, we recently talked about artificial intelligence in the study circle, and here you see the magnificent, magnificent example of computer science being used by artistic minds, the human mind. And certainly, uh, Russ certainly fits into that artistic mind. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, Russ. It's a pleasure. Thank you.